seldom in life do any of us find ourselves in a truly win-win situation. And what I mean by that is a situation in which it makes no difference how things turn out. Either way, whether it happens this way or this way, I'm okay, I win. Either way. I guess yesterday, if you could say I'm an Alabama fan and a Tennessee fan, it didn't matter who won, you won. And there are some of you that if you get up in the morning and it doesn't matter to you whether the rain it's pouring down rain or the sun is shining, you're okay. It's a win-win day for me. But folks, I want to talk to you this morning about our lives as Christians. Because when it comes to our lives as Christians, if I'm speaking to you this morning here and you are a Christian in this audience or you are a Christian who will be listening to this broadcast later, you cannot lose. Do you realize that? You cannot lose. As Paul put it in his letter to the Christians that he wrote to in Philippi, he said, for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. In other words, it doesn't matter if I live or if I die, I, I, I win. It's a win-win situation. To put it another way, being a Christian, folks, is the most wonderful thing in the world. Being a Christian and living the Christian life is the most wonderful thing in the world. There is nothing that can compare to it, and you have a great outcome regardless of what happens in your life. At least that's the way I understand what Paul wrote in these verses that were read for us just a moment ago here in his letter to the church at Philippi. And I want to examine that. What does it mean to live as Christ and to die as gain? How does my living as a Christian just mean more for me and more that happens for Christ while I'm living here upon this earth? Let me just walk you through some things that I think Paul was saying by that. And I hope that these are things that you will think about as you walk away from this this morning and then you will say, I want to do this in my life. I want to live in such a way that these things are happening in my life. But first of all, I want you to consider this. If I get to live on in this world, and I believe that this is something Paul was saying with his statement, for me to live as Christ, I have the opportunity to treasure Christ even more every day that I live. Paul, Paul knew that if he was to continue living on in the flesh, he was standing or he was waiting trial there, being imprisoned between Roman soldiers. He knew that he could die. He knew things could go against him. He knew also he could be released and he could be allowed to continue living. But he knew that regardless, he was going to enjoy, if he got to live on in the flesh, he would get to enjoy and treasure Christ as he continued to live in this life. For those of us here who are Christians today, to be in Christ is the same for us. I want you to think about some of the songs that we sing that emphasize this. What is Jesus to us? Do we not sing that He is my all in all? He is my everything in that which is both great and small? Do we not sing that He is the fairest of 10,000 to my soul? These are words that we use on our lips as we praise Him. Our young people sing, He is our strength when we're weak. We talk about the fact that He is the treasure that we seek. Folks, Jesus Christ is the center and the circumference of our lives. He is the totality of our being if we are Christians here today. He is our reason for living. He is our resource that we draw upon every day of our lives. He is our beginning, our ending. He's our alpha. He is our omega. He is our great I am. Everything else pales in significance when you compare what you have in this life in Christ. And we could go on, but we don't have time. There's so much more that Paul is saying by what he has said in these verses if we have the opportunity to continue living in this world as Christians, 
while we live, we have an opportunity to exalt or to magnify Christ in everything that we do. Listen to the way that Paul puts it here in verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and hope, he said, that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now as always be exalted or magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul said, I have confidence. He was awaiting his, his hearing before Caesar, and yet he said, I have this earnest ex expectation and hope that nothing is going to be brought against me that is going to bring shame to me or to the cause of Christ. Because everything I've done has been to exalt Christ, to magnify Christ in my body. If you and I are given an opportunity to continue living in this world, our aim needs to be that of Paul's. You see, Paul's aim, Paul's goal was not getting released from prison. He wasn't concerned about whether he was released from prison or not. His main concern was whether or not his life continued to magnify or exalt Jesus Christ. He said, if I'm released, good. If I'm not released, that's okay. But either way, I get to keep exalting Him. I get to keep doing the things that bring about glory to Him. It doesn't matter if I live or die. What matters to me is that He is exalted in my life either way. And to exalt Christ and to glorify God is to do those things in our lives which bring praise to both Father and Son in all of our lives. You and I have an opportunity while we live upon this planet to show the rest of the world how a Christian lives. We have an opportunity to show the rest of the world and those that we encounter every day what a Christian looks at with his or her eyes. That he only seeks to look at those things which are good and true and uplifting. That he avoids those things that create lustful thoughts within our lives. We have an opportunity to show others how we protect our ears, that we guard against things that we listen to. We don't listen to music that is defamatory, music that does not exalt our God, that tears down things around us. We do not go around listening to gossip because we don't have time for that. We're too busy wanting to tell others and share with others the good news. We control our tongues. We don't talk about things that we shouldn't talk about. We don't use language that is inappropriate. We don't slander people around us. No, we look for opportunities to build up, to speak good of our brethren. We restrain our hands and our feet. As the little song goes, oh, be careful for little feet where you go, and oh, be careful little hands what you do. We're careful to make sure that what our hands engage in are only things that are good, things that would benefit those who are in Christ. That our feet only choose to walk and go into places that would glorify God, not places that would bring shame or reproach upon Him. We even consider, we, we watch how we dress our personal appearance. Why? Because our goal, our aim, is not to attract undue attention to ourselves. It is to attract attention to Christ. In everything we do, in everything Paul would do, he said, I want to exalt Christ. And as you live on in this world, I want to encourage you that in everything you do, let your life be a life that exalts Him. That at others, as others are around you, it's not about you, it's about Him. And the fact that you know Him and you talk about Him and you live for Him and you're glorifying Him. You know, while... And one of the things that Paul talked about is continuing to bear fruit for the Lord. If he had the opportunity to keep living in this world, while you and I live, we have an opportunity to bear fruit for our God. Paul put it this way in verse 22 of Philippians. He says, but if I live on in the flesh, or if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean, notice this, fruitful labor for me. He knew if I receive a favorable verdict from Caesar, 
If my life is not to end, if I am to, to be allowed to continue working for the Lord, then I am going to use this life to bear fruit for His name, to honor Him. Even as an old man, Paul didn't say, you know, I'm ready to hang up my sandals, go to the beach on the Mediterranean, kick back and just enjoy the view. No, Paul was still thinking, where can I go next and preach the gospel? Who can I talk to about Jesus Christ? He had a whole praetorian guard that he was sharing the gospel with. It, for him, was always an opportunity to do some more work for the Lord. Let me ask you a question. How old are you now? What will you do 10 years from now for the Lord? What are your plans? What are your plans 20 years from now? What are your plans 30 years from now? There was a lady on the news this morning, 105 years old. What would you do for the Lord if you're 105? I remember last year there was a man that at the age of 90 took up learning Greek. They featured him in one of the, one of the news things on Channel 5. Learned Greek at the age of 90. Like to go do a mission at work somewhere? When you're mid-80s, when you're in your 90s? Would you like to do that? Years ago when I was a, a teenager, there were several that would go to the nursing home in Dixon and conduct services. And there was an older gentleman in the congregation that would always, oftentimes, be the one that would lead singing. And I knew he would always end with the same song. The final song that we would always sing at those services had these words in it. You've heard it, but it was his favorite song to sing. It said, lead me to some soul today. Oh, teach me, Lord, just what to say. Friends of mine are lost in sin and cannot find their way. Few there are who seem to care and few there are who pray. Melt my heart and fill my life. Give me one soul today. Can you sing that song? Would you sing that song? Lord, you've given me life. You've given me breath. Give me one soul. Let me reach one person. Let me reach my neighbor across the street for you. Let me reach my uncle, my cousin, my brother, my sister, my mother, my father, whomever it may be. But let me reach one more person for you. Let my life be filled with always looking for one more. How many do you want to bring to Christ? One more. Let it be just one more. There are souls that you, as an individual in this congregation, are able to reach that nobody else here could reach. Because you can talk to them. Because they respect you. And their respect for you will cause them to want to listen to what you have to say. And you may carry respect with them that no one else in this community may carry. And I'm encouraging you, use that opportunity that God has given you while you still have breath in this life to reach that person, to share with them that truth, to let them know you care about their souls. Ask your Father, help me to reach them. Give me the words to say, the courage to say it, and the opportunity to do it. But then Paul also talked about contributing to the progress and the joy of the faith of others. And while you and I still live in this world, we have that same opportunity. We can contribute to the progress and the joy of others' faith. Or as he put it here in verse 24 and 25, to remain on in the flesh, he said, is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, he said, I know that I will remain and continue with you for your progress and joy in the faith. Paul was always one who sought to encourage his brethren. He always wanted to see brothers and sisters in Christ progressing in their, in their faith, progressing in their joy in that faith. As a matter of fact, when you start working your way through his letters, and, and we don't have time to go through everything I wish I could have shared with you this morning, but let me just share a few with you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. What does he say there? Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He said, keep on keeping on, as we might say today. Or, as he would write at the end of that same epistle over in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, there in verse 23 and 24, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. 
as you would write in the second epistle of Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, right there at the very end, verse 14, he would say, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. As he would write in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 23 and 24, he would say, Peace be with or to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. Or as he says right here in our own letter, something that we've already seen back in cha- here in chapter 1, back in verse 6, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. You ever had somebody that you just loved to be around? Because every time you were around them, they just picked you up, lifted you up, encouraged you, and you, you, you missed them when they were gone? I think Paul was one of those people. I think he was a person that when he came back to Philippi or to a place where he had preached and, and come to know the brethren, they loved to see him coming down the road because they knew Paul, well, he just builds us up. We, in, we are encouraged Folks, every single one of us in this room have influence in the lives of those that are around us, and we may not even realize that we have that influence. But I want to encourage you to be a person who is constantly not just looking around this room here, but looking at others that you know are Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, and asking yourself, how can I encourage that person? How can I help them in their progress in the faith? How can I bring more joy into their lives? Because all of us appreciate the encouragement that we get once in a while, and then that we seek to live our lives in a faithful obedience way, or a way of obedience to God. We want people that are encouraging us to do that, and to do what's right. Do you see somebody, a young person making progress in their faith? Praise them. Encourage them. Let them know that they're headed in the right direction and encourage them to keep going in that direction. If you see someone that needs just a little pick-me-up, give them that. Let them know I'm here. I want you to know I care for you. Teach others. There's plenty to rejoice about in the Lord. All of us have things that we can be thankful for and be thankful that we have received. But I want you to use all of your energies to live in such a way that your brothers and your sisters in Christ are built up in God and in Christ and that they want to follow Him and they want to serve Him. But then Paul said something else there. For me to live is Christ, but he also said, for me to die is gain. What did Paul mean? For me to die is gain. Notice what he says in verse 23. I'm hard pressed from both directions. I'm in a strait between, betwixt two. Uh, you know, I've got two things here. And, and both of them, both of them are good. Both of them are win-win situations. And then he goes on to say there in verse 23, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ. I want to leave this life. I want to go be with Him. Why, Paul? Why? You have brothers and sisters in Christ who love you. You have so much good going on here. You're making such progress in the faith. You're doing so many great things. Why would you want to live? Because for Paul, he knew that living, and he's already said this, for me to live on in Christ, for me to keep living in this world, means all of the things that we've just looked at. It meant the opportunity for him to continue enjoying the presence of Christ in his life. It meant the opportunity for him to exalt Christ in everything he did. It was an opportunity for him to continue bearing fruit in Christ. And it gave him the opportunity also to, pro- to encourage others in their progress and their joy in the faith. But for him to die as a Christian, to lose his life for the sake of the gospel, and to pass from this world meant that he could go and be with Christ. I can be with Christ. Why is that something that a Christian should eagerly anticipate and long for? Have you ever stopped to think, why should I as a Christian want to pass from this world and go be with Christ? Why not? And I'm not encouraging any of you to want to hasten your death. 
But I do want you to consider some things. In Jesus' prayer with his disciples in John chapter 17, at the Last Supper, he, he prayed in verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me. And there's a question here in the text whether he's talking about the disciples themselves or believers as a whole because he's just, he's just switched a few verses back talking about not these only but for all those who shall believe in me through their word. But his prayer was that these disciples, these individuals may be with me where I am, that they may see my glory which you have given me. You, for you have loved me or you loved me before the foundation of the world. He said, I want them to be with me. And Paul wanted that too. I want to be with him. We have the opportunity to be with the one that, according to John over in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, is the living one who has the keys to death and Hades. You and I have the opportunity to be with one who David, if you go back to Psalm 11, there in verse 16, or actually chapter 6, Psalm 16, verse 11, what David said is, in your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forever. You and I, while we are still at home in this physical body, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6, we're absent from the Lord. Because he said to be at home in the body is to be absent from the Lord. And then two verses later in verse 8, he added, We prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. I'd rather be with him. Paul says, that's my preference. That's my desire. I want to be with him. If you're a Christian, you win either way. And Paul added one more thing when he talked about to die is gain. He said, for that is, the, the New American Standard says, very far better. And I know that sounds kind of unnatural for us, but in the original language in which this was written, it is a double superlative. In other words, he's saying that is so much better. It is, why? Because, folks, death is a door to a glorious life. It's, it's not just gain, or it's not just release. Paul says, it's gain. I gain. Death and sin no longer have power in my life because my God has given me victory over those things through Jesus Christ my Lord. And we are utterly and absolutely free from sin. Do you realize that when a Christian dies and leaves this world, that individual leaves behind in this world all of the sin, all of the pain, all of the care, all of the anguish that exists in this world. And as our song sometimes says, everybody will be happy over there. How true that is. So Paul says, that's what I want. But let me bring you back to reality. Let me bring you back to where Paul finally arrived in his, in his thinking all, of all this. Even though Paul longed to depart from this world and go and be with Christ, he knew three things to be true. If you go back and you look, you see these three things. Number one, he knew this. It was not his choice to make. He was a servant of Christ. And as a servant of Christ, he would continue to do whatever Christ had for him to do. If Christ kept him in this world, then he would continue to serve and he would be bring more fruit because of labor. He would continue to help others progress in their faith and their joy. He would continue to do good. But it was Christ's decision to make. Number two, he knew something else that he brings out here in verse 24. He says that to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sakes. In other words, for me to stay here, to keep working in this world, it's more important for you, whether you're my brethren at Philippi or my brethren in some other congregation that I've helped to establish, it's more necessary for you. And thirdly, he also knew 
that he would remain and he would continue with them for their progress and join the faith. He knew that God was going to keep him here for a while longer. He didn't know how long, but he knew things were going to work out so that he could continue on for a while. If you're a Christian here today, I want you to know this. Whether you live or whether you die, you are the Lord's. And either way, you win. If the Lord chooses to keep you here in this life and chooses to keep using you in this life, then you have an opportunity to be used up by Him and to bring Him glory, honor, and praise. And I want to encourage every one of you to do that to the best of your ability. Because Paul said, I will be exalted in my body whether by life or death. If God takes you from this planet and you pass on from this and you, you wear this body out in His service, then know this, there's a resurrection body that awaits you that far outshines anything this world has to offer and what we presently wear as the house for our souls. And I want to share with you one final little thought. Back in the mid-1800s, there was a man, his name was John G. Patton, he was a Scot, and he decided that he was going to go to the Pacific Islands as a missionary. An old Christian walked up to him, trying to dissuade him, and he said to him, You will be eaten by cannibals. Mr. Scott, in his autobiography, said he replied this way, Mr. Dixon, that was the other gentleman's name, You are advanced in years now, and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave, there to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I am eaten by cannibals or eaten by worms. And in the great day, my resurrection body will arise as fair as yours in the likeness of our risen Redeemer. Well, that's faith. Whether I live or I die, I'm the Lord's. If I have the opportunity to live, I want to live for Him. If I die, may I be glorifying Him in my death, but I get to go be with Him. But here's the crux in all of this, folks. All of this is only for a person who's a Christian. It's only for a person who's glorifying Christ in their body. So the question for you this morning is, are you a child of God? Have you put Christ on in baptism as a result of obedient faith to the will of God? Have you walked away from a life of sin and repented of that? And, and have you confessed the name of Christ and said, I want to live for Him the rest of my days? Because you see, if you don't live for Him, all of this I've said does not apply to you. It's for those who are children of the King and those who are living their lives to exalt Him in all that they say and do. This morning, if for some reason your life does not do those things, you need to repent. You need to confess that He is Christ and you need to be buried with Him in baptism so that your sins can be washed away and these promises can be yours. If you need to respond, will you not come right now as together we stand and sing?